Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is my last presentation, so I'll take this opportunity to thank uh, Felix again for this. It's been a really a wonderful meeting. I think the quality of the speakers and the quality of the talks has been uh, outstanding. I've been asked to talk about, maybe I asked to talk about this, I can't remember which one, but um, this is an area which for us um, has been a process. We have been investigating the idea of what do we do about the small chambers for quite a long time. Uh, we started off uh, with a very challenging group of patients, uh, and probably if I were to start again, I would not start with this group of patients. Um, that we're talking about here is the true hypoplast with a small ventricular chamber, endocardial fibroelastosis, mitral stenosis, non-apex forming left ventricle. Um, if you're going to start to grow ventricles, this is not the one to start. Unfortunately, we weren't that smart, uh, and so we did start with that. But although we were partially successful, and probably only about a third of those children with that morphology can actually ever get to two ventricles through a very difficult road, um, there are things we learned um, in that process. The most important thing we learned was, and, and again, for the surgeons, it's all about empirical observation. It's not about theory. We hate theories. We like empirical observations. We like to see the results of what, uh, what we do. And so in this group, once we removed the endocardial fibrolastosis, once we treated the mitral stenosis, then we, did, we made the observation that when we did that, a group of the children, nothing happened. The ventricle didn't grow. But then we decided, well, what we need is more inflow. And that was the limiter. So what we decided is in a, in a, in a subgroup of patients, we took the atrial septum, which was, uh, had already been enlarged because an atrial septectomy had been performed at the time of the Norwood operation, and we put a patch there and put a, uh, a perforation in the patch, so we restricted uh, atrial level communication. And we made this observation that in the, if you look at left ventricular end diastolic volume in these patients and using the Z score, in the group where we had no restriction to interatrial communication, we had no further growth of the left ventricle. In the group that we restricted the interatrial communication, we had normalization of the left ventricle. This is in this group of patients. So we took that concept and then we said there must be a theory that we can apply to this because uh, that's how we work as surgeons. We make an observation, then we go look for a theory to try to apply to it. And in fact, um, Larry Tabor, who is at Washington University and is a very brilliant engineer, has been studying the biomechanics of cardiovascular development now for about 25 years. And one of the things he demonstrated is that in the fluid forces, he's looked at blood vessels, he's looked at um, hearts, and actually, interestingly enough, he's actually gotten interested in the fetus, which is a good thing for us, because I think he will, he will teach us a lot of things. One of the things that he demonstrated is that flow is in the fluid forces are a clear stimulus for chamber growth. What exactly it is about the growth, whether it's the velocity of the flow, whether it's the swirl pattern, whether it's what is the actual mechanical um, force that's causing the, uh, the, uh, the induction of chamber growth um, is still subject of investigation. And I think maybe Michael can figure that out, uh, but I certainly won't be able to do that. Based on this, however, we came up with this hypothesis, and that is that a hypoplastic ventricle is small uh, if, they, if they reach to birth. In other words, if they get past the fetal stage and they're born, then the real reason why the ventricle has not grown is probably likely due to a lack of fluid forces, lack of blood flow into that chamber. And therefore, directing inflow at physiologic volumes or physiologic pressures would induce age-dependent ventricular growth. That was our theory. And the rationale for that was based on Larry's work and also our previous observations uh, resecting endocardial fibrolastosis and driving flow into that ventricle. So we created this paradigm, um, and we took patients that were deemed unbalanced complete AV canal and we created three buckets based on these parameters down here. We had patients which essentially had normal volumes, which is in the middle, in the purple here. So left, to right, left and right ventricular volumes were at least 30 mLs per meter squared. Um, 
there was very little override, or so there was some override of the AV valve, but more importantly, all of them had apex-forming ventricles. I don't care how skinny they were, but if they reached the apex, they were thrown into this bucket, into the, into the purple bucket. On one extreme, we had the very small ventricles, which I think you described, which are the ones less than 15 mLs per meter squared, a lot of override, and near absence of one ventricle. So the ventricle is less than half of the apex, uh, a reach less than half of the apex. And the intermediate group, which was all the patients in between, those between 15 and 30 mLs per meter squared, some degree of override significant, they're near apex forming but not true apex forming ventricles. And then uh, what we decided to do is that these patients were going to be managed as single ventricle palliation because we didn't think that we could offer them anything else. And by the way, we did not differentiate between downs and non-downs. So this includes heterotaxy, uh, non-downs, uh, uh, simple AV canals, uh, as well as downs AV canals. And then there was this uh, other group that um, we then decided we were going to figure out how to induce flow into that ventricle uh, in a safe way and see if it actually grew. And what we learned from the hypoplast situation is that if you have a question about whether the left ventricle or the right ventricle, for that matter, is capable of supporting the circulation, it is always safer to manage them a single ventricle and then convert them later uh, while you're stimulating growth of that chamber. So you can do, uh, in these patients, a Norwood operation very much the same way as you would do for a hypoplastic uh, procedure. If you can do something about the mitral valve and the ventricular chamber or the atrial septum as a newborn, maybe, but generally we don't do anything at this age because we have found in a very painful process that things that you can do to a newborn, uh, while you can do them technically, they don't tolerate it very well. So instead what we decided to do is we said, well, you know, they're still growing very fast. At some point, you're going to have to come back and do the Glenn operation. And at that point is when we really start to work on opening the uh, mitral valve. In the cases of the hypoplast, we were resecting endocardiofibrolastosis, but these unbalanced canal patients almost never have endocardiofibrolastosis, so you don't have to worry about that. But often they will have abnormalities of the AV valve. Um, and that's when we restricted the interatrial septum, put a small fenestration, typically it's four millimeters. Why four? I don't know. That's what we empirically observed. It's just like, why do we make a four millimeter fenestration for a Fontaine? It works. Um, that's all I can tell you. It seems to maintain a left atrial pressure that is under 20, which is generally tolerated by the, by the babies. So this is an example. This is a child who's a canal defect. Um, um, I'll play that again, um, who has the uh, elongation of the uh, alpha tract, has a small left ventricle. This is the lateral. You can see here a much, much larger uh, right ventricle. It's almost apex forming, but not quite. Um, and this child had a two-stage uh, procedure. He had a Norwood, and then he had a, a Glenn. This was early in our experience, and we thought, well, okay, that's all we need to do is we need to restrict the interatrial septum and everything will be fine. No, it, it's not enough. And the reason for that is that the flow in the Glen, remember, is only at best half the cardiac output. So if you're getting a ventricle, if you want the ventricle to go, you have to add more uh, blood flow. So what we did was we came up with this idea of what we call a super Glen. Don't ask me for these names. These were the cardiologists came up with these names, okay? I, I don't come up with the names. <laughs> so what we did was what we did was we added a shunt, and typically it was a, a, a subclavian to pulmonary artery shunt, typically aimed it to the opposite uh, pulmonary artery from the glen, and then put a band uh, in between the two, and the band, by the way, has a four millimeter diameter. Again, four is perfect. I don't know why, but it's four, it's perfect. So four millimeter hole here, four millimeter hole, but typically, and by the way, since most of these children are having this procedure when they're typically between four and six months of age, uh, the shunt is four millimeters too. So it's easy to do, remember four and you'll be fine. 
we at the same time worked on whatever else might be restricting flow into the ventricle. So if the valve is stenotic or if in often, as is the case in unbalanced canal, there's a single papillary muscle. I think you very, very clearly described a case of a, of a parachute valve. Uh, or often what will happen is that the attachments of the, um, uh, of the AV valve are to the crest of the septum and the inflow into that chamber is very limited. And so you have to do something about that. And, and what we do is we mobilize papillary muscles. Uh, very often the case, the attachments in a hypoplastic right ventricle are to the crest of the septum. It's a papillary muscle that's never delaminated. We delaminate it. Um, but we do not close the VSD. We simply leave the VSD and we rely entirely on the fluid forces going into this ventricle uh, to stimulate that growth. And the belief was that, in fact, it is the inflow jet that stimulates that growth over time. Um, and this is that same patient now coming into their, to their um, uh, corrective procedure. As you can see, they have some degree of mitral regurgitation here, which we have to deal with. And that's because I think this ventricle grew very rapidly and the AV valve didn't grow as quickly. So you have to deal with that at the time. How do we decide when it's time to go ahead? Well, we do a cardiac, first of all, we, we measure the volumes, but then we also do a cardiac catheterization where we balloon occlude the fenestration and we measure the left atrial pressure. If the left atrial pressure stays in the teens or below, when we occlude in the face of, uh, of adequate cardiac output, I'm not showing the BT shunt here, but often the BT shunt or an RVDPA conduit is still there, um, then we proceed. If it's elevated, then we wait. Um, and, and, and we're not pushed to do anything because if you're gonna pursue a single ventricle management, you will do the Fontaine when they're two years of age anyway. So it gives you that time, that ability to make decisions. Once you've decided that it's adequate, then uh, typically we will take down the stanzel, uh, leave the fenestration in the atrial septum because we believe this ventricle is still small, still non-compliant, and it's a good idea to allow some uh, decompression and then we take down the glen, reconnect it back into the right atrium. So that's the theory, this is the data. Um, these are our numbers. So since we started, we started this, as you can see, a long time ago now, um, about 16 years ago, uh, when we first started. The first few years, we had very few patients because we were learning our way. We were applying this mostly to hypoplastic left heart syndrome. We weren't uh, really applying to unbalanced canals. Uh, and it wasn't really until the last maybe five or eight years that uh, we began to do this in earnest. Uh, and mainly when we saw patients that had undergone Fontana operations at other centers that had Down syndrome and were failing. And they were sent to us, they were, they were felt not to be candidates for transplants. And we simply noticed that their ventricle was good size. We converted them to two ventricles and most of them did all right. So that, that gave us the courage to proceed. So what are the numbers? Well, out of that group, using that, that paradigm I showed you earlier, 82 patients out of the, out of the 212 um, were very small, very small ventricles, and they underwent single ventricle management. That was 39% of them. Primary biventricular repair, in other words, where the ventricle was greater than 25 mLs, 25 to 30 mLs, there were 67, that's 32%. And then the biventricular recruitment, these are the patients that underwent this staged uh, reconstruction. Um, the end result is that so far 50 out of the 63 have achieved a two ventricle uh, physiology uh, with this. This is a very, very busy slide, but all I really want to point out is that many of these patients in these groups, especially the ones that had stage by ventricular recruitment, these are Downs patients. In these patients, we know that single ventricle management in the Downs uh, is a very challenging thing to do, that managing those children after they've had Fontans is very difficult. So uh, our, uh, we get a, a lot of these, mostly are self-referrals by parents who come to us um, because their child's been taken down a single ventricle pathway and we take it down. Other associated procedures are, are shown here, but really, and we see uh, mostly the right dominant, so hypoplastic left ventricle, but we also see a smattering of the uh, um, of uh, left dominant, whereas a small right ventricle as well. 
What are the results? Well, there is mortality. There's no question about that. These are not uh, simple procedures. Um, this, by the way, includes all 212 patients, so it includes our learning curve. We didn't select out uh, the more recent groups, so the entire uh, learning curve is here. About 10 to 12 percent mortality. These are the biventricular patients. These are the single ventricle patients. These are challenging patients because they tend to develop AV valve regurgitation, uh, and over time they, they come back. Uh, this is in months, so we're talking about uh, somewhere in the order of about 10 years here. Um, the, these, these, uh, these patients tend to have problems late um, with uh, arrhythmias, with AV valve regurgitation, uh, and they're very difficult to manage. So at least even though there is a significant mortality early on, these patients, uh, once they survive the, the, the initial set of procedures, they seem to do quite well long term. Interventions, almost all of them have re-interventions, and typically these are cardiac catheter-based uh, interventions, mostly for pulmonary artery uh, en enlargement, uh, because they're, they're um, often these children have had shunts, they've had stencil connections, uh, and so uh, managing pulmonary artery stenosis is a significant issue. Uh, nevertheless, uh, despite the re-interventions, they seem to do have a relatively good quality of life. Surgical procedures. All of, the, all of the Fontans had multiple surgical procedures simply because they were staged. The, um, a lot of the um, uh, uh, non-staged, as well as the staged LV recruitment, also had surgical procedures. Almost all of those were for valve, uh, valve-related problems. So if you're doing this, you really have to plan on reoperating on these kids on their valves uh, as they grow. These are very abnormal valves, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, many of them will require valve replacement. Our institutional philosophy is that having two ventricles and a, and a prosthetic valve is probably better than having single ventricle physiology down the road. But that's a hypothesis yet to be proven. So in summary, um, our institutional philosophy is that unbalanced AV canal defect can almost always be converted to biventricular circulation. There are obviously exceptions, and we have about 15% of the patients uh, where we did not do single ventricle, uh, we, we did single ventricle management, we did not do biventricular repair. Ventricular volumes, anywhere between 25 to 30 mLs per meter square and above, I think can go directly to primary biventricular repair. You don't need to do any, any, any recruitment. The stage recruitment uh, requires augmentation of inflow. How you do this is important, and I gave you some parameters that we use uh, to, to do that, but you want to try to achieve physiologic flows at physiologic pressures in these chambers uh, in order to do that. Um, and then late re-interventions are very common, and this is the price that we have to pay, and particularly the AV valve. So just to summarize again what our current protocol is, uh, small ventricles, and we really focus primarily on this bottom line, and that is, what's the apex of the ventricle look like? If it's nowhere near the apex, uh, that ventricle, whether it's right or left, then probably single ventricle management is the best option. If it's um, a near apex forming or apex forming, you can go directly to biventricular repair, and somewhere in between, you need to consider these uh, rescue or these staged uh, recruitment procedures. Thank you very much.